Hello and welcome to the interplay between inter partes review petition and ex parte reexamination, practical and strategic considerations, hosted by Virtual Patent Gateway and moderated by Grace Wang, an associate at Allen and Overy whose practice focuses on patent litigation in the ITC and district court. Virtual Patent Gateway founder Ashley Chung has a passion for supporting the next generation in the workplace and is committed to developing a growth mindset within VPG. This webinar will be recorded for future use, and if you've registered, we've applied for one hour Virginia CLE. Ashley will notify you when it is approved. We're live on Facebook and LinkedIn, and we'll be raffling off prizes toward the end of the hour, so stick around for your chance to win. And with that, I'll hand it over to Grace. Thank you, Caitlin, and hi, everyone. My name is Grace Wang. Welcome to today's panel. Uh, I want to definitely thank the team at Virtual Patent Gateway, especially Ashley and Caitlin, for organizing the session, getting everyone organized and set up. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a little disclaimer. Uh, this session is purely intended for educational purposes only. We're not giving legal advice um, and any views that are presented by any of the speakers today, they are not the views of their respective law firms or companies. Um, so our panel today is a very esteemed all female panel of PTAP practitioners from Finnegan, Arnold and Porter in Unified Patents. They all have com a combined decades and decades of experience in post-grant proceedings. Uh, before we get into the panel, I'll just share a couple of words on myself. Uh, I'm an associate at Allen & Overy, a patent litigator based in New York. Um, I have about 11 years of patent experience and my practice has been mostly in high tech and med, and med tech. Um, I litigate at the ITC in district court um, and of course at the PTAB. Uh, technical background is electrical engineering and neuroscience. Um, and before doing litigation, I was a patent prosecutor. For so with that, I'll ask Michelle to do a brief introduction. Hi all, I am Michelle Aspen. I am a senior patent counsel for Unified Patents. I've been working in patent law for about oh, six years now, uh, seven years now actually. Uh, and my focus is generally on high tech, although I've done everything from basic consumer products to video code and uh, telecommunications. Uh, at Unified Patents, we use a lot of the uh, procedures that we'll be discussing today, and so I'm excited to talk about this with all of you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Kaiser. I wanted to um, thank, first of all, Virtual Patent Gateway for putting this panel together and uh, to Grace for moderating. And um, so I am in private practice, I'm a partner at Arnold and Porter in uh, focusing on IP litigation and in particular uh, proceedings in front of the PTAB. And before I joined Arnold and Porter, which is relatively new, I just joined this past spring, um, I was a lead administrative patent judge at the PTAB for about seven and a half years. Uh, while I was there, I was focused uh, primarily on electrical cases, but I had a lot of uh, interesting opportunities to um, work on uh, policy initiatives within the agency and also to interface with the CRU, who handles the uh, the ex parte re-exams that we're going to talk about. Uh, before, I, I've, I've actually had a lot of opportunities to do different things in my career, and so before I was at the PTAB, I was a staff attorney at the Federal Circuit. Um, before that, I was in-house um, doing patent litigation at, and IP litigation at Accenture. And then uh, before that, I was at another uh, large law firm, spent uh, my the first part of my career at a large uh, international law firm doing patent litigation in front of district courts in the ITC. I also had the privilege to clerk for then Chief Judge Michelle at the Federal Circuit, as well as uh, Judge Joan Gottschall at the uh, Northern District of Illinois. So privilege and pleasure to be with you all. Hey everyone, my name is Kara, and I, I feel like Jessica should have gone last because I have significantly less to say about myself and certainly less impressive things um, than Jessica has to share. Um, I've been in practice for about 10 years now. I'm a partner at Finnegan. Um, doing a mix of patent litigation um, before the ITC as well as district courts and PTAB and re-exam work um, before the patent office. Um, 
During my time, I also spent a little bit of time in-house working with a high-tech company, and that's the kind of technology I usually focus on is um, computer arts, software patents, um, things like that. I, I stay away from the medical uh, department, so if anybody has questions specific to that, we'll let Grace handle those questions. Um, happy to be here with you all and, and looking forward to the panel. Um, all right, so we just have a slide on overall agenda for today. Um, we're going to start with just an overview of, you know, what an IPR is, what's a re-exam, what are the similarities, what are the differences, and of course, uh, the panel will share some practice tips, war stories, lessons learned. So, Michelle, I'm going to throw this question to you. Um, what's a re-exam? What are the considerations that we, sh that we should be advising our clients um, or that a party should be considering when they're thinking about filing a re-exam? Sure. So an ex parte re-examination is exactly like it looks like. It is an ex parte process, uh, a challenge based on prior art, printed publications, or patents can be submitted against the patent to the uh, central re-examination unit of the office. Uh, anybody can request an ex parte re-examination, including the patent owner, uh, for strategic considerations later in the conversation, we'll be focusing on third-party requesters, as that's more comparable to IPRs and uh, PGRs. Uh, grant is not discretionary. If there is a substantial new question of patentability, re-examination will be granted. Uh, and a director can, in fact, uh, begin a re-examination and raise their own grounds during the process of an ex parte uh, re-examination. Um, because it's ex parte, you, as a requester, you don't get the opportunity to go back and forth with the patent owner on their arguments. You have one conditional opportunity to reply. If a patent owner files a statement after an initial determination that there may be a substantial new question of patentability, uh, most patent owners decline to file this statement because they don't want the third party requester to have an opportunity to reply. I'm just curious, like how, how common is it for the patent owner to kind of make that statement? And like, why, why would a patent owner want, like in what, are there certain circumstances that would make a patent owner want to file such a statement? So I, so Unified Patents has filed a few of these and uh, we, I looked through all of the ones that we filed over the past two years, uh, and there were probably a little over a dozen, and they never filed the statement. Uh, so I would say the answer is it's rare. I think that a patent owner may want to file the statement if there was a glaring omission in the request that was pertinent, maybe a claim construction issue. But again, it just seems like it would be safer just to wait until the requester didn't have an opportunity to reply. Uh, the only consideration I can think for the patent owner is maybe to avoid a stay after an initial determination. And again, only if you have a really strong reason why the re-exam should not continue. Um, so Michelle, I'll stick with you uh, because you you uh, summarized the re-exam so well. So what's an, what's an IPR and what's, what's a PGR and who can raise that and, and on what grounds? Okay, so on the slide, it's a little bit incomplete because uh, both IPRs and PGRs may include challenges based on prior art. And we have a table later that also does a comparison, but PGRs can have challenges based on other grounds as well, uh, such as Section 101. Um, these, unlike re-exams, may be raised by anyone other than the patent owner. So the patent owner cannot bring an IPR or a PGR against their own patent. I'm not sure why they would want to anyway. Um, and in these cases, you do have the ability to respond to the patent owner's arguments. And just like re-exams, there can be an opportunity to amend. One drawback to this over ex parte re-examinations is that the grant of institution is discretionary, which means that there may be non-meritorious reasons for a panel to deny institution of IPR or PGR, uh, such as duplicative grounds or um, 
or a very advanced stage of litigation. Uh, so that is something that requesters, uh, petitioners in these cases must consider when they file these types of uh, administrative challenges. Thank you. And, and Dr. Pat, you know, just, I want to pause a little bit on this last bullet about um, discretionary um, grant of institution. Uh, just two months ago, right, in June, uh, the director of the PTO, Kathy Vidal, she released a guidance memo that kind of clarifies what the PTAP's practice um, might be going forward on discretionary denials. Can you uh, maybe tell us, one, what is a discretionary denial? Two, what's Fintiv? And three, what did the June guidance say? Yeah, so um, for for the in, grant of institution in uh, in IPRs and PGRs, the statute um, doesn't require institution. Instead, it's framed as permissive. The director may not institute unless the standard is met. And so um, the office and the Supreme Court has, in, has interpreted that as giving um, the board a uh, pretty substantial discretion in whether they, the board wants to institute. And the board has developed a number of doctrines around that. Um, Michelle mentioned some of them around multiple petitions and serial petitions and things like that. Um, but one that's uh, gotten a lot of play over the last, uh, ever since uh, the Fintive decision came out and became presidential. Um, and really, Fintive is a doctrine where uh, the board is looking at co-pending litigation in another forum and what the stage of that litigation is. And so um, in the Fintive decision, which is a precedential decision, uh, board decision, um, the board expressed a concern about the efficient, inefficient use of its resources if there's this co-pending litigation in another forum and articulated six different factors that the board will consider in deciding whether to go forward or not. Things like how likely is the district court to, to stay its proceedings? Um, what's the trial date that's set in the district court? Um, how much investment has there been in the district court and how diligent was the petitioner in bringing the IPR proceeding? Uh, what, what's the overlap between those two proceedings? Are they raising the same issues or different issues? Do they involve the same parties? And sort of a catch-all looking at um, any other fact-specific circumstances, including the merits of the IPR petition. Um, Grace, as you mentioned, in um, June, Director Vidal put out a memo with an interim process specific to fintive discretionary denials. Um, before that memo, the director or the, the, the PTO had issued a request for comments and um, as I mentioned, this is an area that's gotten a lot of attention. And so the office got over 800 comments in response to that RFC. And so Director Vidal's memo was really reacting to those comments. And it clarified a number of issues with that. Things like, um, you know, the uh, if, if the challenges have compelling merits, then defensive denial won't apply. Um, it doesn't apply, Fintive doesn't apply if the co-pending proceeding is in the ITC. Um, and it de-emphasized the trial date to some extent by saying it's not necessarily determinative. The board can look at practical realities, can look at median time to trial for the specific jurisdiction. Um, and and some other some other things about stipulations that we could talk about in more detail. But essentially, it puts some guardrails around um, discretionary denial to give parties a bit more certainty about, you know, things that they might have control over that they could do um, to prevent a discretionary denial. I mean, it sounds like the we should expect, or maybe we have already, or are we already seeing that discretionary discretionary denials are going down since the June guidance came out? Yeah, I think there there was, and Michelle, you may have some some data on this. I'm not sure, but um, there was anecdotally, we had already seen them go down because of 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 other precedential decisions that the PTAB put in place, like Soterra, which gave the petitioner the the opportunity to um, make a stipulation that it wouldn't raise in district court challenges that it 
had made in its IPR petition or that it could have made. Um, so effectively eliminating the overlap and the uh, inefficiency between those proceedings. So uh, we, I feel like we'd already sort of started to see them go down and some of what is in the memo really seemed to be um, just making that explicit. And we, we've we seen them go down and, and just as correctly, there was sort of a trend downward, uh, but it was hard to see if that was because of a change in the application of the policy of the office or parties getting more intelligent. Uh, with the new guidance, it's theoretically too early to tell, but there are some things that are very obviously going to change based on the guidance. So for example, ITC FinTIV denials aren't going to be a thing anymore. Um, in September 2020, there was this jump in discretionary denials based on ITC cases, and uh, the ITC can't cancel patents. And so a lot of parties were arguing, well, how does this apply to the application of factors two and four when a district case is stayed in light of ITC, uh, but the ITC doesn't stay cases and the ITC can't cancel patents. And the guidance has said that these factors now weigh against discretionary denial uh, because the because it's just a different, this, this type of administrative aid agency can't address the same kinds of questions that the PTAP can. Um, and then the other big thing in the guidance was if there are strong merits, discretionary denial is not, is very rarely going to be a thing anymore, which means that, so one thing we saw were panels not even reaching factor six because they said all of the other factors weigh in favor of denial. Uh, so we don't even need to get into the merits, but the guidance makes it clear like, hey, the merits are the most important, arguably. Um, so panels will have to step through that now. And so even if there is a discretionary denial, at least there will be some weighing of the merits before that happens and give the parties at least some kind of roadmap uh, in district court of like, well, what are the scopes of the claims? How likely is this to be invalid? Yeah, I, I have a question on that front for the rest of the panel, actually, because compelling merits, um, that part of the guidance seems to be the least concrete at this stage. I, I don't know what that means. I've been reading all the cases that are coming out. There's not a lot of guidance on it. The standard for institution is substantial likelihood of success, right? And now you have this other factor that's compelling merits, but you can't really bring additional substantive arguments pre-institution. Is this a whole different standard? Is this the board inviting additional arguments on the merits before institution to rebut any uh, meritorious arguments raised by the patent owner? That's the one that I think is still a bit of a wild card. I don't know how it's going to shake out, but I'm curious if you guys have any experiences recently. It is. It does. It does almost seem to imply that there would be a trial within a trial. Um, we've always been given the opportunity to reply to fintive arguments because. I think boards recognize it's kind of difficult to predict how patent owners will structure their arguments, even if you try to address it in your petition. Um, so I think that it will be, um, I think more data will come out, but I don't think it completely changes the standard, but the risk of a trial within a trial is there. Sorry, I'm just curious, does this mean, uh, if, if compelling merits is like gonna be something that the, um, that the board is looking at at the institution stage, doesn't this mean that like the patent owner in their pauper, they're just not only going to be, they can't just argue procedurally anymore. They have to kind of address the substance of the petition. Yeah, That's my good. thing as well. Yeah, I, I think there's a real risk as a patent owner nowadays where in, in days past, right, before this guidance, the safe way to go about a, a pre uh, uh, POPR was to just hit procedural stuff, punt on all the substance, hope it never gets past institution. So you've never made any statements about the prior art or the scope of your claims. And now I think there's a risk if you just hit procedural issues, the guidance brings the merits into the procedure. And so there's a risk that you can lose on that compelling merits issue and then lose on Fintive as a whole because you've ignored it and tried to kick it down the road. And are we, are we seeing that? I mean, I guess it's only been a couple of months, but in the poppers filed since since June, is it like, is anyone gonna file, is anyone daring enough to file a popper that's only based on procedure? We've seen it, yes. Um, 
but they do get into a little bit of the merits uh a little bit in number six like we don't think the motivations not deeply um for what it's worth and they don't have a separate merits section they just address the merits in that factor six um we've seen both though uh but we'll we'll continue to see i guess um, I know we spent a chunk of time on this topic, but I think it was kind of top of mind for a lot of people. So I'm glad that I think it was time well, well spent. Um, let's go on to the, the, the next section for this panel. You know, we're just going to highlight some of the kind of the main differences between what's a re-exam, what's a PGR versus an IPR, um, as well as kind of contrasting them with uh, litigation in district court um, and what are considerations for parties when litigating in these different proceedings. So Kara, I will ask you this question. Can you um, just highlight some of the main differences between the post-grant proceedings that we're talking about, um, as well as, you know, amongst themselves, as well as versus district court? Sure. So the, the biggest difference that's at the forefront of everybody's mind, I think, when they're sued for patent infringement is before a district court, if you want to challenge the validity of the patent, you have to meet a clear and convincing evidence standard. So, uh, you know, nobody wants to put a percentage to this, but in my mind, it's somewhere around an 80% burden of proof. If you instead take your invalidity challenges to the patent office, either in PGR, IPR, or in ex parte re-exam, on paper, it says the burden that you have to meet is much lower, preponderance of the evidence. So right out of the gate, it's an easier job to invalidate a patent before the patent office, supposedly. Now I know on the slide, it says that for PGR and IPR, you get a preponderance of the evidence with a bite. And I think that comes into the fact that, you know, you're not getting a jury there. You're getting a, a panel of very well-educated, very informed judges who, you know, dig into all of the merits. And so still a preponderance standard, but you have to convince experts in the field that you have met that preponderance standard that sometimes is construed a bit higher, you know, in, in practice. Um, another difference, and this one's different across all three, is the decision maker. Um, you're going to an Article Three judge or a potentially uneducated jury before a district court. So not only is, is it a higher standard, but you're working with people who are not experts in this technology and trying to convince them that you've proven that higher standard that this patent is invalid. IPR and PGR, you get um, a, a panel of three judges and at least, Jessica can correct me if I misstate this, usually at least one of them is very well informed on this technology area. You might get all three that are well informed, but at least one is going to be a pseudo expert, if not a true expert in this field. So an educated panel that's going to make a decision on your, on your arguments. Ex parte re-exam, you get a single um, examiner, usually the CRU is where it goes. That's the unit at the patent office that determines re-exam stuff. You'll get assigned an examiner. That examiner drives the whole proceeding after your initial request. So with the exception of the one uh, patent owner statement response Michelle mentioned earlier. So now you're getting one person who is knowledgeable about the technology, but perhaps a little less knowledgeable about the legalities not steeped in the case, not spending as much time as you have done crafting the arguments, and now they have to drive the arguments for you. Um, so benefits to each of these three different decision makers. Claim construction is another big difference across these. Um, back in November of 2019, the PTAB changed their standard of construction from broadest reasonable interpretation to the Phillips framework to align that with the district court standards. Now you're getting that ordinary and customary or plain and ordinary meaning in both district court and IPR PGR. Maybe that's a good thing because you can now be consistent across. Maybe you need different constructions for non-infringement that you do for invalidity and now it's complicated your case. So ups and downs for that. Ex parte re-examination, perhaps another perk is that you get a broader construction. You're still getting that broadest reasonable interpretation so long as your patent is unexpired and is not going to expire during the course of the proceeding. So if you're filing two days before the expiration, don't plan on a broader read of the claims. You're going to be right back into that Phillips standard as well. So a lot of differences to keep in mind as you're selecting your forum. Kara, I'm curious, this is Jessica. How, how much difference do you think the different claim construction standard makes in practicality? Um, Practically, I, I think there is a difference 
fundamentally in the way examiners read claims than in the way a court, a judge, or, or APJs read claims, although correct me if you, if you disagree with that because you're the expert in that area. And I, I'm not sure if it's the standard on paper that makes a difference or if it is just the way examiners go about deconstructing the claims and applying prior art that might give you a bit of a different read there. Um, but I do think you can make broader arguments and more creative claim construction arguments in an ex parte re-exam and convince an examiner those are right, where you might fail miserably before the PTAB. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to me because I think on this slide, the biggest difference between the three really is the decision maker, the type of decision maker that you get. Um, and, and, you know, thinking through the types of arguments that you want to make, whether they're can be effectively presented to a, a you know a non-technical judge, a lay a lay jury, um, you know whether they're better presented to APJs who, as you pointed out, tend to be more steeped in both the law and the technology, or um, an examiner. Um, it, you know, because there was a long time when the the PTAB uh, had BRI as well for unexpired patents. And it was always my impression that at, a PTAB, at the PTAB, it really didn't make that much difference in the vast majority of cases. You could have some things around the edges, but generally not. But that's interesting to, to sort of also bring in the, the, the lens of the examiner as well as part of that distinction. Yeah, I think you're right with the decision maker being the big difference, including in claim construction, because the goals of claim construction are going to be different in these proceedings. In a PGR and an IPR and an ex parte re-exam, claim construction is all about only addressing the scope of the claim to the extent necessary to resolve a dispute. And so if you have obviousness, even if you accept somebody's construction, claim uh, patent owner's construction, claim construction doesn't really matter. You don't technically need to construe it because it doesn't go to the ultimate dispute. Whereas in district court, claim construction is almost about giving the jury a dictionary so that they can understand what these words with this legalese to, to many lay people means. And so the purpose of claim construction in these proceedings is more different, I think, than the standard being applied. So I have a purely hypothetical question. Let's say in district court or ITC or somewhere, um, you know, patent owner was wanted a certain claim construction and they got it, they won it. Um, now we're at the re-exam stage and it's a different, you know, that, that was obviously under Phillips. Now we're at the re-exam stage and the, can the patent challenger use their own words against them and say, yeah, even though re-exam is under BRI, look your examiner to see like what patent owner said about this term elsewhere. Can we read that? Can we bring that in and say, even under BRI, you know, regardless of what the standard is, patent owner has made this statement and they should be held to it. Not only can you, but you really should do that um, as a challenger, because BRI can only be broader than whatever the Phillips construction is. The, uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen a broadest reasonable interpretation be narrower than a district court interpretation of the claim. Um, but Jessica and Carrie, you might correct me if I'm wrong on that. No, I mean, I think that's exactly right. and. Um, you know, I, I mean, if the if what the district court construction is 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 what you need in uh, as as a challenger in the re-exam, then you're definitely going to point to that. And you know, I think the CRU will look closely at that as as adopting it, or you know, it would be as as Michelle said, at least as broad. Um, you know, because you know, it, it's funny in um, either PGR or IPR. Um, or in re-exam, usually the um, the challenger is is often the one looking for a broader construction so that it encompasses the art um, that you know that you're asserting. Um, district court's a, a different animal, right? Because if you are the challenger, you're also the defendant, and so um, the broader construction may not be great for you because. Um, of infringement reasons. So you have different calculuses too in, in terms of the patent owner and the 
and the the challenger in these different forums in terms of how you might, you know, in a perfect world, want the claims to be construed, but what balance you have to strike. Um, so, Michelle, can you um, highlight some of the practical differences between re-exam, PGR, and IPR? The timing and the scope are the big um, differences. So, ex parte re-exam can happen any time after the patent is granted, and anybody can file it. Post-grant review, you have a limited window to file, but you have a lot you can challenge. So only within nine months of granting the patent, uh, and you have more than just obviousness and anticipation grounds, you can challenge based on patent eligibility and written description, enablement, and indefiniteness. Uh, inter partes review, you can file after the period for post-grant is over um, for any patents granted after the, uh, I think it was September 2013 was the line, but I may be mistaken on that. For patents under the AIA, it's after the post-grant review period ends. For non-AIA patents, uh, it's after the patent has been granted. Um, and the Threshold showing of grant is different for each of these cases. And so for ex parte re-exam, theoretically, uh, it could be the highest question, but not always. It's substantial new question of patentability. Are you giving the office something new? And have you shown that there's a substantial question that the patent is patentable? In post-grant review, you have two alternative uh, options. You can show that you are more likely than not to succeed or present a novel legal question that has not been before the office before. So maybe the office never considered a uh, written description or enablement uh, and you are presenting that for the first time. Uh, and then an inter partes review, inter partes review, it's reasonable likelihood of success. Now, I don't know if there has been a, you, you can't, you don't usually see the same patent challenged on the same grounds in all three. And so it's hard to say whether or not these threshold showings are different in practice, because I feel like most of the time it's it's relatively binary. Do we think they're likely to be invalid or not? Um, so in practice, these threshold showings, you should make a strong showing of unpatentability in your first grounds, as, as we'll discuss in a little while. Um, inter partes review arguably has the, the lowest level, whereas ex parte re-exam, depending on how the examiner is reading that substantial question, uh, could be equivalent or higher than the post-grant review. Um, time at the PTO, ex parte re-exam can go on forever, uh, but Post-grant review and inter partes review, usually about 18 to 19 months is the maximum time from when you from when you file. And whether you can remain anonymous, it's possible in ex parte re-exam, but not in post-grant review or inter partes review. Your name is public and out there when you challenge a patent. And just pausing a little bit on this anonymous thing, like what are when, what are the situations in which someone might want to consider filing an, uh, a re-exam anonymously as opposed to like having their name on it? Um, well, I think in some cases, there are a lot of different reasons. Uh, we've never filed anonymously, I, I think I can say, um, but you may be a competitor somebody and you're not trying to instigate mutually assured destruction of, pat uh, uh, of one another's patents. And you just wanna challenge this one patent. You just want to do this one test case. Maybe the maybe you're worried about an infringement read, and so you try to file a blocking challenge. Uh, and so there may be strategic reasons to do that because if the patent owner says, "Oh no, that's nothing like our patent," then you can go through if they ever see, accuse you of infringement and say, "Well, we filed a blocking challenge, or somebody did, and this is this is what happened. Therefore, we don't infringe." Um, I. I don't see it happen very often. Um, another reason is, and this one's a little bit underhanded, but maybe you wanna challenge again after you already lost and you don't wanna get accused of harassing the patent owner. Um, that should not be your reason for doing it anonymously, but I think it might happen. 
Um, and when at the beginning, when we talk about like patent owner filing a statement in the re exam and then the third party getting a chance to like respond to it, sort of, or, or answer it, uh, can you still do that even if you're anonymous? Uh, I don't recall actually. Um, okay. I don't, I don't recall. The, the, the anonymity doesn't mean the lawyer's name on the bottom of the page is anonymous. It just means the party they're representing is. So usually how people go about this is, you know, I, if I wanted to file anonymously for a client, I would write the papers and then hire separate counsel to review them and file them under their name. It has no past affiliation with whatever entity it is. And then you build kind of that barrier between a, a word of caution that Michelle started on. If you are stopped because you lost an IPR, do not file an ex parte reexamination anonymously. You have to certify that you are not a stopped. That up, that's, continues to exist even if you're filing anonymously. So don't, that, that is not a reason to file anonymously um, at all. That's the only hard and fast rule I have on that. Noted. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, Jessica, um, can you talk a little bit more about kind of some of the practical differences across the yeah, so um, first one listed on this slide is is pretty important, and it's the the estoppel that attaches, um, and that's um, primarily here what we're talking about is the estoppel that can attach for what you can um, assert as uh, the challenger in your co-pending litigation. And so if you bring an ex parte re-exam, you, you don't have any estoppel attached, but for both post-grant review and IPR, um, under uh, the statute 315, I think it's E2, um, you're stopped from bringing, at, and this is a stop that attaches at a final written decision. So you have gotten through the, uh, the entirety of the proceeding. You can't then raise issues um, that you either raised um, or that could have been raised. And so um, if you're a patent challenger in either an IPR or PGR and you have co-pending district court litigation, you sort of have to think about what does that estoppel cover and what's left for me to uh, potentially have as challenges in the district court. And it's, it's helpful to note that the scope even between PGR and IPR is different because the challenges that you can raise are different. And so for PGR, you're kind of giving up everything, right? Because you can bring 101, you can bring 112. Um, whereas for IPR, it's it's generally only uh, 102, 103 based on patents and printed publications. Um, there's some district court cases about, um, you know, if you if you have a printed pub in IPR, but then you have product art, can you know is the dis is the product art still fair game in district court? Um, so that's one key difference and key consideration is thinking about that estoppel. Um, another is just, and in, in a way this goes to cost, but but also time, is um, discovery and evidence. So when you're doing your request for ex parte re-exam, you can submit a declaration, but there's not going to be any party discovery because it's ex parte, right? Um, for PGR and for IPR, you also have declarations. You'll probably have multiple declarations because as, as a challenger, you, many times you'll have a reply declaration after the trial is instituted. Um, and you also have discovery. So you get depositions that go along with those. Um, you can, in, in some cases, you can have more intensive discovery, not nearly the scope of what you might see in district court, but um, if you have cases that have secondary considerations or other issues like that, you can have more discovery. So that's a consideration too. And then the last topic on this slide is appeal. Um, the main difference here is that with um, ex parte re-exam, um, you only, it's only the patent owner that can appeal. So you as the challenger initiate it. If the patent owner doesn't like the result, they can appeal. They go through the PTAB first and then to the federal circuit. For PGR and IPR, because it's a you know a contested proceeding, you end up um, with either party being able to appeal um, directly to the federal circuit, um, with the caveat for standing requirements. It seems like this estoppel is like the scariest thing, right? Like it's like 
not what you raised, but what you could have reasonably raised. Does this ever happen where like a patent challenger kind of gets close to, uh, the, the, the estoppel only attaches at the, at the end, right? After you get the final decision. So I'm just thinking like, does this ever happen where the patent challenger, you know, you file your IPR, your PGR, you're going along and then you, you just get like, you just feel like the board is gonna side against you. You just, you just, you, I don't know, like you, you just think that the patent owner's arguments are good or whatever. Can you pull out of the IPR and just say like, never mind, I don't want the final decision because I don't want estoppel to attach? I mean, that doesn't really happen, right? So, I mean, the, the main reasons why you can ask for the board to terminate. Usually parties do that based on settlement, not just because they don't like where it's going. And usually with the petitioners, you know, you once, because the estoppel doesn't attach until the final written decision, you've already gotten a decision on institution where the board said you have a reasonable likelihood of success. Um, so I've never seen that attempted or happen. I think more what you think about is what, like I was saying, what's left for district court after the estoppel. And um, the other thing to mention, we were talking about Fintive, we were talking about stipulations. And um, the Cetera stipulation, which essentially is the same as the estoppel, essentially we'll just take that estoppel and move it earlier in the proceeding, move it to after institution. And so you have to make, um, you know, those, those decisions and that, that, um, that thinking through the strategy of what's left for district court earlier in the process than you otherwise would if you make a Cetera stipulation. Yep. And maybe just for the benefit of our audience, can you just explain what is a Cetera stipulation? When would a party a patent challenger uh, make such a stipulation and at what stage? Yeah, so um, we were talking about fintive discretionary um, denial doctrine earlier, which is where you have this, this issue of a co-pending district court litigation. And I think it was either Michelle or Kara who mentioned that you usually, um, as the challenger, if the patent owner raises fintive, then the petitioner um, will usually get a preliminary reply, and that's prior to the board's institution decision. So as the petitioner, you're usually um, thinking about stipulations at the pre-institution stage. If you know it's going to be an issue, um, you have a lot of facts about the co-pending litigation, you might think about it at, um, at the time that you're filing the petition. Um, if the facts have changed, if so, you know, if the, the patent owner raises certain arguments, you might think about it instead at that preliminary reply um, stage, putting in a stipulation there. But basically, there are different scopes of stipulations that you can put in based on, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, how, how poor your fintive facts are as the, as the challenger. So what you think that you need to give to avoid this fintive denial. And they have names based on the, the cases that they came from, the board cases that they came from. So Soterra comes from a presidential board case. Um, and that's essentially the same scope as what we have on the screen. You're agreeing not to raise in the district court um, any uh, issues that you either did raise or reasonably could have been raised if your petition is, has been issued. There's also an informative board case that's called Sand Revolution. Um, where uh, the stipulation is much narrower, um, where it's essentially just you won't raise the same the exact same challenges in the district court. Not surprisingly, the board tends to weigh that less heavily in favor of um, not exercising its discretion. Um, and then petitioners have offered stipulations that kind of fall in between. Um, I've I've always sort of referred to those as CN plus stipulations, where you might um, offer a stipulation not to raise things based, you know, the same challenges or anything based on your primary references, things like that. Kara, Michelle, do you guys have anything to add on like estoppel stipulation and how that's kind of played out in your practice? No, I think that covered it really well. <laughs> <laughs> I might have thought about all these things a lot when I was a judge. <laughs> Great. Okay, so um, Kara, now what every client wants to know, right? How much does all of this cost me? 
is it worth it? What am I going to get out of it? Can I stay like my district court often pending the post grant proceeding? Yeah, so if, if you're looking at these numbers and thinking, man, this stuff is expensive, you are completely right. And I will just say, while the first row is set by statute, um, so those are fixed costs, second one as well, legal fees really vary by the facts of the case. So I think this is a solid estimate here, but don't, don't be running off and thinking this is like a quote that you should you know be giving to clients and things. Um, in general, and maybe one of the perks of using ex parte re-exam is the legal fees are generally substantially lower. Um, I want to caution you a bit that that maybe $20,000 is a low, little lower, um, depending on the complexity of the issues involved, than, than I would maybe think myself. Um, can it be done for this? Of course. The best re-exams, in my view, and I, I think Michelle agreed with me, she's done a bunch of these as well, are written almost like an IPR, but maybe throw in a little bit more in terms of other stuff that are required um, in, an, in an ex parte re-exam. Like you don't have a page limit, so you can slap some claim charts on the end to make sure you're really covering every limitation. Um, you might be able to throw in additional grounds because you don't really have a hard and fast page limit or word limit like you do in an IPR. Those types of things can drive up fees. Um, one place where you can save money, though, if, if you're looking to do so, is ex parte re-exam. Absolutely nothing to do after you file the initial, with the caveat of, of the reply to the patent owner statement. So when you look at the PGR and IPR columns, you can see there's you know numbers through hearing, numbers through appeal. As a requester in an ex parte re-exam, you don't get you don't you don't get to participate in any of that. So your your legal fees in theory in theory, are cut off as of the filing date of your request. A um, couple caveats to that, of course, but generally that keeps the fees down. You have no discovery, your expert's not gonna be deposed. A lot of that stuff that gets expensive just doesn't exist. Um, but going back to the big strategic decisions, are those weak points in your argument? Do you have what you need from one filing where in an IPR PGR, you're getting multiple papers and opportunities to argue before the board here, Cheaper, maybe, but you're losing a lot of the advocacy that might be beneficial to really win out the day. Um, so everything's always a trade off. In terms of a district court stay, um, this is also highly fact dependent across the board. So there, there's a set of factors. Uh, it does vary a bit court by court, but the, the big one that every district court really looks in at is how likely is it that this proceeding that's been filed before the patent office is going to, to simplify the issues that I need to resolve in this litigation that I have to decide on. And um, as you can see, you know, across the panel here or across the final row, courts are often hesitant to find a substantial likelihood that the stuff is gonna be simplified for them, the issues are gonna be simplified for them until you have an institution decision. And when you look into case law on ex parte re-exam, you might be thinking, well, a stay then should be more likely if I have a grant of the request. But a grant of the request is not a rejection of the claim. So there are a lot of courts that not only look for that grant that says, yes, you have a substantial new question of patentability, but an office action that says these claims are actually now rejected based on the prior art that's been presented. So in terms of timing, the longer you can wait and the more feedback you have from the patent office, whether it's the PTAB or the CRU, the more likely you can show to a judge that it's beneficial for them to stay the case, because that's really what it's all about. Are you going to make their job easier? Okay. Um, that said, there are a lot of district courts that will generally not consider a stay regardless of how far along you are. Um, I think everybody can guess which courts those are. I know Judge Albright has gone on the public record saying he does not like to stay. Judge Gilstrap's standards, uh, like statistics on stay, very, very low. Um, Judge Connolly in Delaware, another one, very low uh, stay rate. So if you have any of these judges, you might not want to be banking on getting a stay. Other courts, Northern District of California, sometimes it's judge specific, generally a little bit more favorable for a stay. So be sure to check your case law. Um, and if you're in Texas, don't, uh, don't bet the farm on getting a stay. Yeah, maybe uh, one other thing to point out about this chart is, as Kara said, you know, the, the 
the filing costs, those are pretty set. The legal fees, you know, are pretty variable. Um, and I also noticed the legal fees for this slide are based on a 2019 survey. And um, I, I would submit the, that IPR and PGR practice has gotten only more complicated since then because of some of these discretionary doctrines that we've been pointing out. Um, but any of this is gonna be extremely variable in terms of legal fees based on the complexity of, of your case. How many claims are you challenging? How complicated are those claims? Um, how many experts might you need? Um, these, these cases can be extraordinarily complex. Um, you know, I'm thinking of some of my colleagues who do a lot of pharma cases, those can be extraordinarily complex and require multiple experts. So I just add that caveat on the PGR IPR um, legal fees side as well. And then the only thing I would add is all of these numbers are often relatively small when you're facing a eight, nine digit uh, infringement suit. Yes, and remember you get that lower standard um, for invalidity before the patent office that might be worth the investment to get out of the district court with the invalidity arguments. Right. Yeah. Great, that was a great kind of overall summary. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip what looks like a lot of slides and come down to this one um, just to kind of continue the discussion on sort of considerations of um, kind of the title of this session, right? The interplay of IPR and, EP and XPR. Um, so kind of Jessica, for a party who's maybe kind of just starting out was just sued and they Let's say, you know, cost isn't really an issue. Of course it is, but let's just assume like cost isn't an issue. They have the luxury of choice. What, what should they be considering um, in deciding between um, ex parte versus IPR that, um, you know, Kara hasn't already covered? You know, I think it's important just to take a holistic view of what your dispute is and what your goals are. So, you know, what is your strategy in district court or the ITC? Um, what are sort of your, your pain points around that? What kind of art do you have? Um, and do you feel like it's important for you to be in the driver's seat of your challenges? Um, is it something that you feel confident that you can explain in, in one paper and really let the, um, you know, let the, the, the office handle after that? Or is it important for you to really um, be involved substantively through the, through the process to be able to explain the nuances? So I think you know, that, that, um, that balance between what you need for uh, district court versus patent office proceedings and then how much control you need is, are the things that I primarily think about. I, I like the kind of the three C's, cost, control, and count. Uh, so if you have a lot of good grounds and a lot of alternative possibilities in interpreting this patent, IPRs get really expensive really fast. And if you feel like any of them could be winners, even if not all of them, it might make sense to put them all in an ex parte re-exam. Uh, cost, if your client can afford, in IPR, they, they can't afford it. And so you file a, a re-exam. Um, blocking art versus true read art, I think that actually doesn't move the needle too much for me unless you have both. Um, I think one thing that a lot of litigators don't do that they that that is a strategy they may want to consider if their client is trying to save money is if you're sued on a lot of related patents do your test case in an IPR uh, and get an institution decision in, in six months or, or however soon you can. And if you get a positive institution decision, then maybe prepare the rest for an ex parte re-exam that will take a little bit longer than the IPR. Um, of late, ex parte re-exam has been moving much faster than it has in the past, but the office does try to communicate between its different units. And I think it's actually gotten very good at that over the last few years because it has applied a lot more pressure on the parties to let them know 
when there are pending related applications and ex parte proceedings that they can track. And so nobody really uses both, but I think uh, that's a strategy that people will start to see as cost-effective in the future. Kara, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the, the times when I use both IPR and, and EPR is usually when you've gotten a procedural denial in the IPR. Ideally, offensive denial, so you don't have a 325D problem where you really cannot raise the same challenges. If you have a offensive denial, you can just take exactly what the board just refused to hear on procedural grounds, take it to the examiner where offensive is not, not an issue. Now you're six months behind the eight ball, right? Because you've already gone through institutions. So that's kind of a concern as well. Um, I've also done quite a few um, follow on EPRs, if you want to call them, after a 325D denial, where you know the board said this art's too similar to stuff we've already considered. You don't have new arguments. And you tried again with all new arguments. Maybe stuff isn't as strong. But now you've got an examiner who might be taking a broader read of the claims, so you can get a little bit more creative with your reads. Um, that is a point that I, I, I know when we were practicing for this, Jessica and I and, and Michelle talked about ad nauseum. We don't have time now, but that's difficult given the um, you know current 325D, um, I, I guess, temperature at the CRU. They haven't given it teeth yet. They're still granting things as long as you can differentiate enough. But... There's a lot of pending petitions that say, hey, the board's improper or the, the CRU is improperly applying 325D. Stop these follow-on petitions. And I, I'm going to pass this off because somebody will not leave me alone here. I apologize. Kara is in high demand. No, that was that was great. Thank you so much. And we're out of time. Um, any final remarks for anybody? No, I, I, I just want to say I really appreciate this discussion. I think this has really been a fun panel. Ashley's reminding us that uh, we're going to pass it back to them for a raffle. Um, but I, I've been very appreciative of, of having this discussion. Great. Well, thank you so much to our esteemed panel today. And I'll pass it back to Caitlin at, um, so to, to do the raffle. All righty, everyone. We are raffling off three prizes today. The first one will be a VPG tote, a branded VPG tote bag. So we're going to let the magic hat pick somebody for that. Oh, and we've got Connor. Connor has won VPG tote bag. Congratulations, Connor. Our second prize is a bottle of red wine. I believe you get to choose the type of red wine. So let's see who gets the bottle of wine. Lissy, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations. All right, and then we have one more prize, which is uh, our VPG Building a Leadership Habitat book, which was authored by VPG's founder, Ashley Chung. And I'm supposed to tell you, it has many fun puns about PTAB, so definitely something you want on your bookshelf. We have Michelle. Michelle has won our last prize. So congratulations, Connor, Lissy, and Michelle. Uh, we'll be reaching out to get information from you for those. And that's all from me for today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Grace, for moderating. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Great work. <laughs>